Father, I thank you for this dear brother. I thank you for how he has affected my life over the years. Thank you for the friendship. I thank you for the partnership between our two churches, Lord. And uh, I pray that as he opens up your word and opens his mouth to preach, Lord, I pray that you will fill him and empower him with your Holy Spirit. I pray that Jesus would be magnified. I pray that you would receive all the glory, Father. So we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Clover Hill. That is so awesome. (laughs) If you're visiting today, so am I. (laughs) So so welcome. Uh, We're glad that you're here. Uh, For those that don't know me, now you know me because Mitchell uh, introduced me, but I have the privilege of serving as an elder at River Oaks and the Growth Group Discipleship Pastor. So I'm excited to be here this morning. One, to, to be with you all, see some faces Uh, shake some hands, hug some necks, and two, to get to preach the Word of God to you. So I'm excited about that. We'll be in Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. While you're turning there, for those that that know me, you know that one of my passions is is hiking. Okay, so right now, Heather and I are preparing for this summer where we will be embarking on multiple day hikes between 8 and 16 miles a day. Now, that may sound exciting to you. That may sound terrible to you. But you've got to admit that there's some level of wisdom in just getting outside and walking around. I mean, the shortest of walks can clear your mind, can raise your spirits. I can quote to you study after study that shows how walking outside it decreases your cortisol, lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure, even your cholesterol. Personally, I love hiking because it gets my face out of a screen and it gets me engaging with the people that I'm walking with. So in the Bible, you, you don't see the Christian life described as a series of, of soaring mountaintop experiences. Rather, we learn that the Christian life is a lot more like a branch connected to a vine. It's like fruit that is slowly grown by the Spirit over time. My favorite metaphor from Scripture describes our Christian life as a walk. Paul uses the word walk in this way four times in the book of Colossians alone. Our walk is simply our life as Christians, what we do, who we are, what we believe, just lived out in everyday, ordinary ways. Now, that may be how we see it, just as ordinary. But we're going to see in our passage today that what we see is typical, as humdrum, as ordinary, is actually wise and extraordinary to those on the outside who do not have Jesus. So let's look at Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6 with me. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us, a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I I thank you for the opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters this morning. I thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word. Father, I pray that you would keep me faithful to the text, that you would fill me with your spirit, and that you would allow me to proclaim you and your son clearly in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So our main idea from the passage today, the only reason that we can walk in wisdom toward unbelievers is because of God's grace toward us in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. So in other words, we can be intentional about sharing Jesus with unbelievers because we were once on the outside, saved by Jesus intentionally pursuing us. So the question we have to ask this morning, though, is how? 
how do we walk in wisdom? And Paul, thankfully, provides us answers by praying and by doing, or, as we'll look here, asking, verses 2 through 4, so how should we pray? And acting, verses 5 through 6, how should we engage with unbelievers? So, congratulations, Clover Hill. You have almost preached your way through your first book. This is, this is pretty exciting, okay? This is awesome. Now, I, I'm asking you to keep your eye, though, on Eric as Mark, because if he gets his way, you'll be preaching back through Colossians pretty soon, okay? But his, his enthusiasm for this book is understandable. I mean, it, it, it combines a high view of Christ with what it looks like to practically live our lives with Jesus at the center of it. I mean, that, that combination of truth and action, it's, it's what makes our passage so powerful. This section is for all believers. Every single person in here that claims the name of Jesus Christ, this passage is for you. It, it comes right after the household codes in Colossians. So what's, what should be happening in our homes, in our workplaces, that lets us know that in this next section, Paul is addressing every believing man, woman, and child with this passage. So how does he start? Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. It shouldn't surprise us that Paul links our asking with our acting. Prayer is inextricably linked to our walk as believers. We know this. I mean, there are times where I'm praying, Lord, help me take the next step. But look how, how Paul opens Colossians with prayer in verses 9 and 10. Colossians 1, 9 and 10. He prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so they could walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So according to Colossians 4, then, how, how should we pray? What should we ask for? There's two ways that come up here. Two ways. We're praying for ourselves in verse 2, and you're praying for others in verses 3 and 4. So how do you, how do you typically pray for yourself? I'm going to guess that it's not continuous. It's maybe not steadfast. Rather, you might pray as a, as a reaction to something that happens or an immediate need that you have. But the idea of this steadfast and continuous prayer, it, it begins to make a lot of sense when we think about what prayer actually is. What prayer is, is, is a stated dependence on God. Now, there are many actions that I know that I cannot just make happen through determination or willpower or sheer grit. I can't do it. One of those is for sure being thankful. An attitude of thanksgiving is how the NASB describes it. So if, if we're thinking about walking in wisdom towards outsiders, one action that stands in stark contrast to the world is an attitude of thanksgiving regardless of circumstances. You want to draw attention to Christ? Be thankful while everyone else is complaining. I'm preaching to myself here. As usual, you're getting to listen in to a sermon that Art is preaching to himself. A couple weeks ago, a pipe sprung a leak in our house, ruined two, two rooms in, in our house. And, and if you're listening to me, you're listening in to me discover that situation, you would have thought, kids, this is more for you. You would have thought, man, this guy sounds just like Eeyore from, from Winnie the Pooh. The, the amount of whining and complaining. Oh, this house. Oh, the copper pipes. Could I catch a break? Come on. And at the same time, the same week, I, I found myself praying with a fellow, a fellow elder. And, and we're praying together and we're thanking God together for inexplicable sadness thanking God for suffering in that way so we can walk alongside other people suffering in similar ways. Now, the difference between whining and thankfulness 
comes down to prayer. Praying gives us perspective. That's what Paul means by being watchful. You know this, that when you're praying, it it gets you out of your own head and it gives you the opportunity to consider how you might be thankful, should be thankful, even in circumstances that are hard. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this, so I want you to ask yourself, what keeps you from an attitude of thanksgiving? Especially thankfulness in suffering circumstances. Thankfully, we aren't just told, hey, be better. Guys, just just do better. Could Could you be more thankful? We're not told just to do that. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 tells us exactly where the power comes from to walk in thankfulness. You have received Jesus Christ, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. And I love that picture. We're walking and we're rooted you're rooted, you're built up, you're established in him so you can walk out in thanksgiving. So we pray. We pray for the Lord to remind us that we do first because we are. We take action because of who we are rooted in. So we pray for others. According to verse 3, and we go to the Lord on behalf of others. You know this. You do this. I I believe that what Paul asked the Colossians to pray for here, it's rooted in his thankfulness, his thankfulness for Christ. I don't see another explanation of why he would pray what he prays or ask them to pray what he asked them to pray for him. Verse 3 reminds us that Paul is imprisoned. It's likely house arrest. But regardless, I want you to picture this for a second. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, chained to a Roman guard. When he sleeps, when he relieves himself, when he bathes, when he writes, when he prays, when he has visitors, all the while chained to another man. What a nightmare. If any of the, the introverts in the room could just, I don't want you to raise your hand big because that would, you know, but just a little bit of like, yes, a living nightmare to have no privacy at all, ever. So how does Paul ask the Colossians to pray for him? How would you ask the Colossians to pray for you in this situation? Paul asked for an open door. He asked for an open door, not out of prison, but rather an open door for the word in order to declare Christ No trace of self-pity, no anger, no bitterness. Think of this. He's already in chains for declaring the gospel. So in effect, he's asking them to pray for him to be able to do more of what landed him in prison. That's convicting. I mean, when I experience suffering, especially undeserved suffering, My first thought is not give me more Christ. It is give me relief. Get me out of this. So what do we do? Verse 3 shows us clearly we pray for each other. We pray for each other. We remind each other that we are exactly where God has placed us in this marriage with these kids with these parents, at this job, we are exactly where God has placed us to glorify him and share Jesus Christ. I need brothers and sisters to remind me of that. Paul asked them to pray that he would declare the mystery of Christ in verse 3 and declare Christ clearly in verse 4. What is the mystery of Christ? So I want you to to flip over to chapter one. It's the beauty of Colossians, right, Eric? I mean, it's just, it's right. It's one page. Just flip it over. Colossians one. 
We're going to hang out there for a minute towards the end of the chapter. Verse 26 of chapter 1, the mystery hidden for ages, but now revealed to the saints. Verse 27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles, you and me this morning, are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. If you could see my manuscript right now, it's bolded there, it's underlined, and it's italicized. The mystery of Christ is your union with the second person of the Trinity. You are in union with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. No wonder he is our hope and our glory. What a mystery reveal. For believers, this means you should have expectations. Expectations for your growth group leaders. Expectations for your elders, your preachers, and teachers. Chapter 1, verse 29. They toil. They struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works in them. To what end? Verse 28. To proclaim Jesus to warn you and teach you with all wisdom so they may present you mature in Christ. So I have complete confidence that when we gather together at Clover Hill, at River Oaks, you hear Jesus proclaimed clearly. The mystery proclaimed. Why? Because Jesus is your hope. Jesus is your glory. Jesus is your life. He is your salvation. He is your sanctification. He is your wisdom. Jesus is your strength. He is your advocate. Jesus is your king. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's your inheritance and you are his. Amen. When I'm preparing to preach, I ask my friends to, to pray for three specific outcomes, that I would have fidelity to the text, that I would be faithful to the Word of God, that I would be passionate, and that I would preach with clarity. The moment I step out of the pulpit, I I lean over to Heather and I ask her the same question every single time. Was I clear? Was I clear? I'm still not sure exactly what I would do if she said no. I would would get up and say, can I try again? But I want to know immediately if she thought that Jesus was clearly proclaimed, did I preach Jesus and him crucified? That's fine. You mean, okay, Art, the, the pastor guy, the preacher guy, elders, growth group leaders, that's fine for them. But this talking about Jesus clearly again, it's it's not just for the apostle Paul, it's not just for pastors. This passage is for every believer, every man, woman, and child. So you might be thinking, why why would clarity on Jesus be crucial? Let's, Let's think about where we are. Why would clarity on Jesus in the Bible Belt be crucial? Everyone around here, they're cool with Jesus, but do they treasure him? We know why that's not the case. Sin blinds us, and the cares of the world get so many people focused on different things. So many of us with with poor vision, we've we've had that crazy moment of putting on glasses, of popping in the contacts for the first time, having having LASIK surgery, walking away from that, and and having that experience, I mean, I knew that that was a tree, but I had no idea that each individual leaf, you can see that there are single leaves on a tree. Some of us, maybe, on the other hand, put it finally just saying, okay, it's time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the readers. And, and, and the, the words on the page are actually clear, despite how long your arms might be trying to grow, so you can see things clearly. So what's the point? I mean, seeing Christ clearly makes it easier, makes it a pleasure to share who he really is to a world that's blind to him. It's a tragedy when outsiders write off the wrong Jesus because they've never been given a clear picture of who he actually is. 
And we get to participate in that. Brothers and sisters, we, we don't proclaim a set of rules, but a redeemer. We aren't presenting a straitjacket on life, but freedom in Christ. Not one who chokes off happiness, but one who invented joy. Our two churches, ah, it is a pleasure to pray for you all to have an open door to proclaim this Jesus as he is calling outsiders to come to him. No cleaning up first. No getting your life in order first. No self-improvement. No showing you're a better person first. Pray that we would proclaim Christ without any prerequisite, without any reservation, without any qualification. If you were on the outside today and you want in on this, there are elders, there are brothers and sisters that would love to pray for you at the conclusion of this, this service. We ask and we act. It is possible to do two things at the same time. Okay, walking and chewing gum. I've never understood the challenge there. You can just, you can kind of do that, right? I mean, that's, that's no problem, but patting the head and rubbing the stomach, I'm not going to try that at this point. But we can walk and chew gum at the same time because we don't have to think about it. It's, it's reflexive. So Paul envisions this kind of Holy Spirit, both and, for believers. Both asking and acting, talking and walking, praying and doing. And the doing, the walking, that's where Paul goes next in verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So again, our walk, our lives, our conduct as believers. Paul opens the letter by praying that Colossians would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Here he instructs them to walk in, in wisdom. The word for wisdom means prudence. It's one who's self-controlled, able to govern himself, one who's reasonable. Now Paul has a target audience in mind for our walk, outsiders, those without Christ. But why would Paul choose wisdom as the walk he wants outsiders to see? Why, why not walk in love toward outsiders or, or walk in truth towards outsiders or walk in morality towards them? Of course, we are to walk in those ways but we're to walk in wisdom toward outsiders to show our faith is not only true, but also the best way to live. Our, our faith is not just morally good, but it's utterly pragmatic. I want you to follow the logic with me. If, if wisdom is knowledge applied to life, then life functions better when you follow Jesus. Now, you, you know me well enough that this is not some health and wealth wackadoodle promise that I'm, I'm making you here. This is a principle that you can observe. Here's what I mean. A Colossians 3 life simply works better than a worldly life. A life that reflects kindness, humility, patience, forgiveness, thankfulness, and love, it just flourishes better than a life defined by harshness, pride, impatience, spite, selfishness, and hatred. Families where wives submit to husbands, husbands love their wives, children obey their parents, and fathers encourage their children, just works better than homes where those actions are absent. Our religion is so much more than practical and wise but it is not one ounce less than practical and wise. Greg Kokel and Sam Chan, they talk about one of our roles as believers is to demonstrate a life that works. Because this, this concept is a critical mass in an insane world right now. I mean, 30 years ago, the world operated under this premise. Show me that this is true 
and I will believe it. Now it is show me that this works and I'll try it. Consider the Roman guards chained to Paul. How is it that according to Philippians 1, that the gospel made its way through the entire imperial guard? Now, typically, these guards serve the emperor and his family as bodyguards. One of their additional responsibilities was to guard low-risk prisoners like Paul. So according to the historian Josephus, a Roman guard would be chained to a prisoner for a four-hour shift. This means six men a day were chained to Paul. Now consider the contrast between wisdom and foolishness those men must have seen. What did they see while guarding Nero? He claimed to be an artist and a genius, but he was sadistic and insane. What level of vice, debauchery, and violence did these men witness as Nero's personal bodyguards? What did they see with Paul? They saw a white-hot passion for Jesus Christ that looked like joy, reason, and self-control. They witnessed true genius in the letters he was writing. Imagine these, these guards overhearing Paul's wisdom in conversations with Epaphras, Luke, Tychicus, and so on. So no wonder Paul could say being in chains had served to advance the gospel. So I, I made a new friend this week. That might surprise some of you all, but yes, I made a new friend this week. His name is Jacob. He's been a, a, attending River Oaks for a couple of months. And on Monday, he sent me an email sharing his story that rocked me in a good way. Uh, Jacob was raised in church, but over time he became, in his words, an angry and devout atheist. In God's providence, Jacob was assigned to work in a city near a Christian college. And I'll, I'll just share his own words. I hit a moment. I hit a moment when I realized nearly every employee who was excited and cheerful around me and just seemed to honestly love life despite making hardly any money at all were the students from that Christian college. Here's the contrast. He says, I'd seen religion decline in America, but I'd also seen that the secular world had no answer for what should take its place and everything they tried was a sad substitute. Hear this. In the end, it wasn't a debate well argued by an apologist, anything said by a religious friend or anything presented by a preacher that made me consider I was wrong about Christ. It was merely his people living good Christian lives and shining to a point that it was undeniable they had something other people did not, no matter how much I didn't want to see it. <laughs> Dear believer, take encouragement from Jacob's testimony. What you may see is just your ordinary, plodding, day-to-day -day walk as a Christian is a gift from God to unbelievers. Do not underestimate God's wisdom in your joy, in your kindness, in your reasonableness to others. It does not go unnoticed. If, if we stopped here, we can make a mistake that, that our primary role as, as Christians is merely to model to unbelievers how to live differently. To be wise instead of foolish. Come be different like us. Come be better like us. But there's more to it. Colossians 3, Paul lists all the reasons that the wrath of God is coming. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and idolatry. Then this bomb in 3.7. In these two, you once walked. We used to walk as fools. Now we walk as wise, 
Why? Not because we're better than anyone else, but because we were rescued by Jesus Christ. You were once alienated, outsiders, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Jesus is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, Colossians 1, 21. You have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of the beloved Son, Colossians 1, 13. The only reason we walk in Christ Jesus is because we have received Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 6. Even though we demonstrate the wisdom of God by how we live, we are not saying to outsiders, live our way because we're wise. We are saying, look to Jesus. Get out of yourself. Receive Jesus by faith. An increasing wisdom will be one of many glorious outcomes of a life lived in union with Christ. So how do we make this case? How, how do we present this? By being wise with our time in verse 5 and our speech, verse 6. But Paul is, is talking about a specific use of time here with the word kairos. He's, he's not counting or measuring time. He's talking about the quality of time. Making the most of the opportunities that we have by being intentional with our time. Now I know, because this is my own idol. If, if we want to stir it up, we want to get out a big stick this morning. You're on the hike with me, we're on our walk, and we see a big old hornet's nest of idolatry, and we just start poking it with the stick. It's, it's listening to what the Bible has to say about how we should use our time. Two groups of people need to be challenged about time this morning. Some don't have much going on and need to be challenged to invest your time in others. Others have submitted to the tyranny of being so overcommitted that your lives are typified by comparing with your friends how crazy busy you are. No, I've got this on this night, but I've got this. I can one-up you by what I've got going on Saturday, too. I'm crazy busy. <laughs> I think it's Vadi Bakum that says, if you can't say amen, say out. So I'm saying both along with you. I'm, cur I'm encouraging you to think about time less in terms of, of quantity and more in terms of quality. This is what I mean. You you go to school with, you live next to, you, you work with unbelievers. Invite outsiders into what you're already doing. Do you drink coffee? Yes, okay, tea, water, that's fine. Do you, do you drink a beverage? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Do you eat? The answer is yes. Ask an unbelieving friend to join with you while you have that water or eat that meal. Are you going to a movie? Are you watching the game? Are you working on your car? Are you going on a hike? Invite unbelievers into that. I'm not talking about adding an official time, a block of time on your calendar that says, here, here it is. All right, I'm investing my time. I'm going door to door witnessing. Paul, Paul is assuming something else entirely here. He assumes ongoing relationships with outsiders. So, so you're inviting them into your life where they will witness you being you and all the weaknesses, all the idiosyncrasies, all the wisdom of Christ. You, you, you could preach this as Guys, you better have a good witness because people are watching. That's not it. That's not it. We, we are living in the joy of Christ, knowing, knowing that as you invite unbelievers into your life, you are going to mess up. You are going to fail. You're going to fail them. You're going to sin against them. It's not over. 
it, it, at that point, that's where you show that unbeliever something maybe they've never experienced before. You ask their forgiveness. You show them the redemption that you have in the Son. The continual union that you have with Him, even when you mess up. Walking in wisdom, investing your time, it's all been building to something. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The goal of intentional time with an unbeliever is intentional conversation. Walking leads to talking. Time spent with unbelievers allows you to know them well enough to graciously answer their questions, seasoned with salt. Now, those of you that know Heather, you know her as she is now, as an incredible cook. That's one thing amongst many, but she is an awesome cook. But the first few years of our marriage were filled with things like turkey bacon, skim milk, and very little salt. <laughs> so I stand before you thanking the Lord for the discovery of Benton's bacon, 2% milk, and generous amounts of salt. <laughs> salt makes food taste better. It adds flavor to what otherwise would be bland. Think like uh, French fries. It brings out flavors that are already there. Nice steak, okay? Or it provides a contrast with a different sort of taste. Think salted caramel. Okay? When... When Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door, what do they do? They launch into a bland, canned monologue. They don't know you. They know a script. As Christians, we invest the time to know outsiders so that we might know how to answer their questions. And if we're answering their questions, oh, here's the dagger. It means we've taken the time to listen. I know it's hard sometimes, but we're listening. Even if we know the outcome, we know where things are headed with the foolishness of how they are living and what they are saying. We're still taking the time to listen. I know answering questions can sometimes sound intimidating. You may be thinking, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to answer every question that an unbeliever might have. But I, I want you to connect some dots this morning. We're living our lives in, in the wisdom of Christ. Then some of their questions might sound like this. You never complain about your spouse. How come? You're, you're, you're not ticked off right now at our boss over what has just happened? Why? Why? You never seem rocked about what's going on in the world right now. It's crazy out there. Why can you be so calm? Or one of the best questions you'll ever hear. Hey, I know you're one of those people that pray. Would you pray for fill in the blank? What an opportunity. Some of their questions might be more pointed regarding our faith. Brothers and sisters, we want that. We welcome that. In fact, if they're not asking questions about Jesus, it's gracious and it's loving to ask them questions to get the conversation headed towards Jesus. Please hear me right now. This is for every believer in this room. When you ask another person questions, who's doing the talking? They are. So all the pressure is off of you. Remember, you're, you're building a relationship here. You're not pressing for a decision. You can do two things at once. Pray and ask God to help you be curious rather than nervous. We listen and we respond because we know that the ultimate answer that each person needs is Jesus Christ. We want those on the outside to come on inside. 
We want them to taste and see the Lord is good. Walking and talking. Two of the most mundane things that we do, yet God in his grace plunders the domain of darkness in the most ordinary of ways. I think again of my new friend Jacob. He witnessed the walk of joyful, wise, and salty Christians. Their walk helped open a door for him. And he eventually visited River Oaks where he heard Jesus proclaimed clearly. And at some point in the last... Almost made it. <laughs> At some point in the last three weeks, Jacob placed his faith in Jesus Christ. He described the sermon he heard like this. And he's here today if you want to talk to him. <laughs> Through a common story I'd heard a hundred times, the preacher brought up the two greatest things I struggled with. Understanding that Jesus is sovereign and that faith was required to understand his true nature. The sermon weighed heavily on me, and it made me realize that if I wanted to know Jesus, I had to accept him on faith. So sometimes, like the best hikes or the best walks, you get to see beauty along the way. Waterfalls, huge caves, breathtaking views. The walk takes time. But it's, it's glimpses like we get with, with Jacob that shows you the joy of it. There is no joy comparable to seeing someone on the outside be drawn into Christ and begin to walk by faith in him. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the fact that you have saved us from the way in which we once walked. We confess that we were foolish. We were led astray. We were slaves to various passions. We hated you. We hated one another. And yet you, in your kindness, saved us. You washed us. You renewed us by the Holy Spirit, by your grace. Father, I pray that every single believer in here, there would be a joy in walking alongside outsiders. Help us to see unbelievers as you see them. Father, break our hearts for those that, that are, are following their own passions and can't or won't see you. Give us your patience, give us your grace, give us your wisdom as we seek to come alongside and point them to you and your love. Help us see it for what it is, worship of the one who saved us by, by your grace. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.